technical. Um, yes, hi, I'm Quinn Dombrowski from Stanford University, um, and I'll be talking about nimble tents and bunkers, safeguarding digital cultural heritage. So this was my life, more or less, as of February 22nd, um, a time not that long ago, but it feels much, much longer ago than, than it actually is. Um, I, I have an interesting split position between Stanford Libraries and the Division of Literatures, Cultures, and Languages, which includes all the literatures, cultures, and languages, except for English, East Asian, and classics for various administrative reasons. Um, so in February, I had a number of projects going with faculty and, and grad students. Uh, we were looking at sort of representation of different countries in YA literature um, over the 21st century. We were looking at uh, multilingual Harry Potter fanfic and which characters were paired with which characters and in, in fanfic written in Italian and in Russian. Um, and, and I had a, a pedagogical feminist project um, on computational text analysis called the Data Sitters Club, where we were amassing uh, the Babysitters Club in translation um, across many, many languages and, and applying uh, you know, natural language processing and, and other things and, and writing up the whole process to make it more accessible for people um, you know, we're more familiar with uh, the Babysitter's Club than uh, computer science. So this, I, I, was, I, was, I was busy, I was involved in these projects, um, I was a bit anxious about, you know, how things were going in, in Eastern Europe, but, but, you know, keeping up with the day-to-day -day things. And then Russia invaded Ukraine. And I was on a train coming home when I heard about the invasion starting. I went into campus the, the next day and went up to the textile makerspace that I run and, and worked on a, you know, no to war sign and, and hung it up in the window of my office. And like everyone at that point, I was, I was doom scrolling the news, um, feeling helpless, feeling like there wasn't really anything that, that I could do um, from California to, to fix the situation, but I, I couldn't look away. And then February 26th rolled around, and Anna Kias, a music librarian at Tufts University, uh, posted to Twitter something about a virtual data rescue session that she had planned for the following weekend. Um, and, and this, this is, you know, I, I really like this idea, the, the idea of, of being able to, to, do, to do something, to do anything, um, to try to capture resources. And um, I wasn't the only one who thought this was a great idea. Uh, Sebastian Mastorovich um, in Austria at the Austrian Center for Digital Humanities and Cultural Heritage um, also saw this and replied and suggested that maybe Web Recorder could be a tool that could be useful for this project. Um, at the same time, I, I was watching this and, and feeling very anxious. You know, it, it was the first weekend of the war, and at that point, I, I don't think we had any sense of how tremendous uh, the response would be from the Ukrainian army. And I was worried that, you know, perhaps these, these sites wouldn't still be standing a week out when this event was planned. So I, I got everyone together, we organized a, a meeting on, on Monday, um, and on Tuesday, March 1st, Suto launched. Uh, we literally made the website as we were writing the tutorials, as we were on Slack and setting up that space. And uh, you know, th this, this initiative was inspired by um, kind of many previous efforts in, in the broader space of, of trying to rescue digital data. In 2016, there was a, a data rescue initiative um, kind of in the wake of Trump's election to try to archive government sites before they were taken down. Um, on one hand, this, this has some parallels in web archiving. On the other hand, it's a very different matter to be looking at web archiving over sort of a controlled period of time. You know, we, we had from you know, the beginning of November until late January uh, to go about this in a very orderly and uh, you know, very library-like fashion. There were elaborate spreadsheets created and taxonomies and workflows, um, you know, done in a very well thought thought through manner. And this was the initial model that Anna was going to use for the the you know music data rescue session. Another project, though, that this also takes inspiration from um, was led by Alex Keel and others, uh, the, the Nimble Tense project and, and the tool that they put together in the wake of uh, some mapping work that they did after Hurricane Maria. And um, you know, dealing with sort of mapping and relief effort related issues um, after a natural disaster, again, has, has some parallels in the sense of, you know, this is dealing with a, a country in a state of emergency. However, a, a natural disaster is, you know, hopefully hopefully a, a one-time event, and while there's some degree of fallout from the disaster, um, the situation on the ground isn't changing quite so rapidly. So 
March 2nd, by the next day, the second day of Sucho, uh, we already had over 400 volunteers um, joining our Slack and starting to do things. And we, we started taking notes and, and trying to write up what we were doing as we were doing it um, with the goal of, of helping the next people who do this sort of project. Um, then March 4th came along and the Internet Archive had a power outage that basically knocked out an entire branch of the work we were doing for the entire morning. And this was a, a really sobering event. Uh, we've been you know, tremendously supported by the Internet Archive throughout this whole process. Mark Graham has been in our Slack, um, along with various others from the Internet Archive. They've, they've been tremendously wonderful and helpful. Um, but it really has been a striking lesson in how much web archiving goes through the Internet Archive. And, and that can serve as a single point of failure that can be catastrophic when you're in an emergency and need to be spending every hour capturing things, having things just go down um, because of a power outage um, is, is a tremendous problem. So th this, this really sort of gave me a different perspective on web archiving in general and, and the practices around web archiving and the role of different tools within that space, and particularly the value of things like Web Recorder and the, the new uh, you know, browser tricks software, um, which enables sort of distributed capturing that people can do on their own laptops, um, where suddenly you know, it's, it's you know, all hundreds of people can be archiving sites without having that single point of failure that, that can just take down entire workflows. So that same day, um, later that day, we had a, a beta launch of BrowserTrix Cloud, which is a, a cloud-based interface for running the BrowserTrix web crawler. And um, th this was amazing to, to see it working. Um, I mean, literally, there's a simple web form that you fill out, and then you can watch it. Um, if you have you know, any of those giant you know, display walls that libraries are, are you know, so fond of these days, I, I feel like nothing would bring me greater joy than to just run Browser Tricks Cloud with you know, 16 different web crawlers going at once, sort of flashing through these pages. Um, I, I sometimes just put it up on my second monitor and, and, and watch these um, kind of appear in, in all of their you know, diversity and beauty. So by March 7th and 8th, we, we were there for one week. We had over a thousand volunteers um, and we moved from new infrastructure. We started on, on DigitalOcean um, literally because that was what uh, Sebastian Mastorovich was able to just buy himself and get set up in the very beginning. Um, we, we got some emergency funding from the Association for Computers and the Humanities and the European Association for Digital Humanities uh, to basically pay him back for his initial out-of-pocket costs, which were what got the project started. Um, but since then, we've been running uh, primarily on Amazon Web Services, which has been incredibly generous with offering us credits, um, you know, both for the cloud interface and for our storage costs, which are, are large and increasing constantly. Uh, we, we have some tremendously creative volunteers running uh, browser tricks on all kinds of devices, including a Raspberry Pi. Um, and, and we have a documentation on our website for if, if you too would like to do web archiving on a Raspberry Pi, um, it is possible and well documented now. March 16th, uh, we launched Browser Tricks Cloud, and, and this this sort of you know, broader internal launch really brought web archiving to, to all ages. Uh, Chris Milligan sat down with his daughter and um, she archived a Ukrainian website and drew us a picture of the experience. Um, there, there she is on, on the left in her house safe um, archiving this site um, you know, that's, that's in Ukraine um, on the right that's, that's being bombed and there's a, a sunflower in the middle and a Ukrainian flag and a, and a peace sign. Uh, but this, this got me thinking that, um, you know, she was six and, and I too have small children uh, and an elementary school and, um, you know, a community of people in, in Berkeley, California that generally want to help with this kind of thing. Um, and so uh, March 29th was uh, perhaps the first web archiving event for elementary school families. Uh, we, we got a bunch of families together and, and after a conversation about how to discuss the war with kids, we had an, an all family hands on event where I had extracted a, a set of um, URLs from our, our giant spreadsheet for Sucho and um, families sat down and, and archived websites. Um, and th this has actually become a bit of a problem in my house now because the eight-year-old is, is very into um, archiving Ukrainian websites and he knows reliably um, if he says, oh, can I just go to bed a little bit later so I can save a few more websites, he, he knows I'll say yes. Um, 
so some of the things that we've saved, um, these are a few of my favorites. Um, this is the, the National um, Folk Art Museum, uh, the, the ceramics section. This is a, a two-faced lion from the 18th century, one of the first things that a volunteer posted in our random channel. Like, how can you not love that face? It's, it's smiling. Every time I see it, it brings me joy. Um, this was a museum that was dedicated to a um, old East Slavic uh, epic poem, the, the tale of the Lay of Igor's campaign that was famously translated into English by Nabokov. And it was a poem that I read in grad school and, and could still remember the opening lines to. And the, the, I, I found it so wonderful that there's a museum literally for an epic poem um, in Ukraine. But you know, knowing that this was a site that um, we tried to capture in, in a fairly quick manner because uh, the city where the museum was hosted was under siege that night, um, it, it was um, a really emotional experience to, to do that one. Um, and then there are just many things that, that are cultural heritage, but not in the way that we, we commonly think of it in these spaces. Um, not just libraries and archives and museums, but kind of manifestations of cultural heritage in the lives of everyday people. Uh, this was a, a music school that had um, pictures of various dance performances um, in the city that uh, sort of made the news a, a week or so ago for an ammonia leak. And you know these these pictures of of just regular everyday life and the way that cultural heritage plays a role in in children's lives and just you know the the daily existence of living in these cities before the war um, is is precious and it it needs to be saved as well. So the current state of Sucho, we we have over thirteen hundred volunteers. Um, as of maybe last week, we had twenty five terabytes of data. I'm sure it's it's more now. Um, and, and that's just things that we've captured using Web Recorder. We've also been sending um, hundreds of thousands and, and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of URLs to the Wayback Machine. Um, we've also uploaded almost 15,000 files to the Internet Archive. Uh, we work through hundreds of new sites daily. People submit links, and we even have people digitally walking through the streets of cities that we see are under attack, looking for the cultural heritage icon on, on Google Map, just street by street. Um, we figured out that it costs about a dollar per site using Browser Tricks Cloud um, on free AWS credits to, to capture a full site. Um, we also still have people running uh, Browser Tricks on their own laptops. We've, we've taught people how to use the command line and how to use Docker uh, through this project. It's, it's been an interesting upskilling, um, you know, upskilling in a hurry kind of, of opportunity. And we have uh, partnerships in development with Europeana and the NFDI. Um, you know, to think about sort of what being able to, um, you know, mirror this data and provide additional technical infrastructure and human resources. So all of this is a nice story, but you may wonder here, you know, where, where are the libraries and where are the collections? And the, the answer is that um, one of the things that we've learned through this project is um, in an emergency, uh, libraries and large cultural heritage organizations, including ones that have sizable technological resources, are, are actually not the right people for the job um, to get things done fast in an emergency. Um, this started because, again, Sebastian just like plonked down his credit card and bought some storage space, bought a domain name, and started crawling sites um, fast immediately. And we all jumped in on Twitter. We all joined a Slack instance. We all started doing this. And um, you know the, the response from, we each sort of put out feelers within our own institutions for what we might be able to do using that infrastructure. And the answer was meetings meetings and meetings and meetings. And, and when we finally started syncing up with um, some of these larger organizations about a month in, uh, you know, we found that, that for the first month, more or less, there were a lot of meetings that were happening. And, and this is you know, understandable and this is, this is correct you know, from a certain perspective. Um, you know, libraries you know, cannot and perhaps should not be just leaping in and, and grabbing things. I mean, libraries are, have a, a longer term view. They have their processes for reasons. Um, and all of that is good. But um, you, need, you need both in an emergency. You need people in there actually capturing stuff. Um, and, and at some point, with the goal of, of syncing up with the organizations with a view for, for the long term. 
Emergency web archiving is like making Molotov cocktails. I mean, we saw images like this early on in the war. Everyone out in the main plaza, bring your beer bottles, bring your hand sanitizer, let's do this. Um, and and that, that feels a lot like what we're doing with Sucho, um, you know, running things on Raspberry Pis and people's own laptops and, and you know, things here and there and, and acting fast in, in a hurry. Um, and it's an inspiring story and, and everyone, everyone loves to hear it. Um, and it is. But at the same time, it's also a, a failure of infrastructure. Um, if it gets to the point where everyone's out making Molotov cocktails out of beer, bottle, uh, beer bottles and hand sanitizer, something has gone wrong. Um, and, and similarly, emergency web archiving um, you know, is not and should not be like an actual solution here. Um, perhaps there is a role then for libraries as sort of a, a digital uh, Barbara Stollen, um, which is a, a bunker in the Black Forest in Germany in a former you know, mining cave where literally they have microfilm um, in a bunker, you know, sort of to preserve digital cult or sort of physical cultural heritage in some form for the long term. Um, is there a role for libraries to do something similar in the digital space with web archiving? And, and so what we would like to, to offer here is, is an idea of a proactive network of mutual web archiving. Um, you know, I, I, I kick myself thinking of the time that you know, we could have been liaising with you know, librarians and archivists in Ukraine in January when we knew that something was likely to happen, uh, but everyone was still sort of going about their normal lives. People were still easily available via email in a way that they're not right now. Um, what could we have safeguarded if we could have had those conversations with them and, and planned ahead instead of acting reactively? What if we could build relationships among cultural heritage workers? Um, you know, who are your colleagues in Hong Kong right now? What are they doing? What are they thinking about? Um, how can you help them? And, and how can we broaden that network so that you know, maybe, maybe what we need is a, something along the lines of sister cities um, where everyone has their one job or their, their set of jobs, a set of you know, national libraries or museum sites that once a year they, they archive so that we know that there is a place where it will be kept safe. What if we turned Web Archiving Week into a global celebration of cultural heritage where you know, that's the time where we all sit down and we, we capture this stuff so that you know, if there is an emergency, if there's a disaster, we know that there is a copy of this safe somewhere else. There's a lot of thought being put into you know, offsite storage and you know, mirroring things among partner institutions, but often those are all in the same region or all in the same country, which is a terrible thing if you consider the situation of a war where all of a sudden um, all of the copies are at risk. And we need to start these conversations now. I, I you know, don't delude myself with thinking that you know, any conversations we have now about proactive web archiving are gonna help Ukraine. They're not. It's too late for that. And if we start these conversations now, and in fact, on, on Friday, um, we have a, uh, a conversation with Vox and Banda and UNESCO um, about some of these issues. If we start these conversations now, they're probably not going to help the next war, and they're probably not gonna help the war after that. I you know, am under no delusions about the speed that these conversations can have, um, but you know, they need to start, and maybe four wars down the line will be able to, to help people um, in a way that, that we can't do with emergency reactive web archiving with Sucho. And talking about cultural heritage, I, I feel like it's apt to end with a poem that sort of speaks to this moment and, and speaks to what we could potentially do for one another uh, to make these kinds of emergencies less necessary in the future. Um, and so calling upon the American poet Gwendolyn Brooks and her poem, Paul Robeson. That time we all heard it, cool and clear, cutting across the hot grid of the day the major voice, the adult voice, foregoing rolling river, foregoing tearful tale of bale and barge and other symptoms of an old despond. Warning, in music words, devout and large, that we are each other's harvest, we are each other's business, we are each other's magnitude and bond. Thank you. <laughs>